This is Crime Dog. Roll the intro. Before we get started, please do not even think about subscribing to our channel. Every time someone subscribes, our dogs howl for 10 minutes straight. So please just give it a rest. Cecile Bloch, 11 years old, lives in the 19th arrondissement of Paris with her parents, Suzanne and Jean-Pierre, both social security officers and her half-brother, Luc, who is 24. At 8 a.m., her parents kiss Cecile goodbye and they leave the apartment to go to work a few streets away. They make their way to the elevator. Jean-Pierre moans to Susan as the light in the hallway has been out for three days now, as he fishes around in the dark for the switch. Not to mention the door in the entrance hall, which had been forced open a few days earlier. The only working elevator arrives on the third floor, and when the doors open, there is a young man inside, presentable and well-dressed. The couple say hello, and the elevator makes its way down. As it arrives on the ground floor, Cecile's parents exit the elevator. The man wishes them a pleasant day, remains inside the elevator, and the doors close. 15 minutes later, Luke tells Cecile that he's heading for work, and she should make sure not to be late for school. Back then, it was pretty common for kids to make their own way to school. Luke follows the same route as his parents minutes earlier. He calls the elevator, and when the doors open, he is met by the same guy who says hello. When they arrive at the bottom, Luke gets out, and once again, the man remains in the elevator. In a few hours, one of the largest criminal cases in French history will begin, lasting 35 years. At midday, Susan tries to call her daughter, who is usually back at the apartment to have some lunch and to take the dog out for a walk. Suzanne calls Jenny, a friend of Cecile's, who makes the journey with her to school every day. Jenny answers and says she hasn't seen her this lunchtime, nor this morning, as a matter of fact. Suzanne's heart drops. She grabs her husband and they run back home as quickly as possible. By 1 p.m., they are back at the flat and they run in shouting her name. Cecile is not there. Suzanne notices that Cecile's bag is missing, so she must have gone out. But to go where? Jean-Pierre calls the local hospitals, but there is no sign of Cecile. The couple exit the apartment now in a blind panic. She never missed school, there were no significant problems at home, and no reason for her to leave. As they exit the building to retrace her steps, they ask the janitor to search the building. He recruits a couple of friends and they join in with the search. They start at the top of the building and make their way down, but they find nothing. They arrive in the basement. The first room is empty, the second is locked with a key. The third is full of items that have been abandoned over the years. The janitor gets out his torch and scans the area, but there is no sign of Cecile. They are just about to turn around and leave, when out of the corner of his eye, he spots a piece of carpet that appears to be covering something up. As he approaches, he sees a limp hand and cries out for help. As Cecile's parents return to the flat, having failed to find their daughter, they are met by a sea of ambulances and police cars. They follow the trail of officers down to the basement and try to force their way through, but they know it's too late. Cecile has been abused, strangled, and stabbed in the heart. The assault was so violent, her spine was broken. The killer spent several hours in the building, revealing his identity to multiple witnesses. They all say the same thing about the suspect, a young man with severe acne scars all over his face the same man that calmly greeted Cecile's family in the elevator. At 9.15 that morning, a girl called Sonia had just parked her car in the basement parking and was headed to the elevator. When it opened, the same man was in there, sweating profusely and composing himself. Just minutes earlier, he had murdered Cecile. He is seen leaving the building at 9.20, meaning he spent at least an hour and a half inside the building and approximately 40 minutes with Cecile. It was probably the busiest time of the day, people coming and going on their way to work, 
but the killer didn't seem to care. Detectives conclude that he must have waited for Cecile in the elevator, and when she entered, he took her down to the basement, sticking a match in the elevator button to keep it pressed in so the doors would remain blocked, long enough for him to commit his heinous crime. In total, six witnesses, including Cecile's family, identify the same suspect, and an accurate sketch is put together by police and released to the press. Due to his noticeably bad complexion, he is quickly nicknamed in French Le Grulé, or in English, the pockmarked man. Unbeknown to officers at the time, he had already struck before a month earlier, and it's not until the death of Cécile that they make the link. Just like Cécile, Sarah leaves her apartment to go to school. Once again, the elevator dings, the doors open, and there is a man inside. He presses level minus four and forces Sarah into a dark corner of the basement. She screams. He punches her and throws her onto a mattress that he had prepared in advance, forces a cloth into her mouth and ties a rope around her neck. Recounting the incident which she thankfully survived, Sarah said, I couldn't breathe, I passed out, and when I awoke, I remembered nothing. She comes to 15 minutes later in pain with no idea what's just happened. She sees her hands are tied, but she manages to wriggle out of the knot. She turns on the light and has the intelligence to not go back in the lift, taking the stairs up to her apartment where her mum lets her in. When police arrive, it becomes apparent that Sarah has been abused. At the time, DNA testing was in its infancy, and it wouldn't be until years later that tests would confirm that the two girls were attacked by the same perpetrator. Many of the cases I will be talking about today were later proven to be committed by the same man due to DNA testing, which wasn't available at the time. The assault on Sarah was planned in advance, and he presumably thought he had killed her before fleeing the scene. And there were more incidents involving young girls and a man with severe acne and puffy cheeks. <laughs> Natalie returns home at 5 p.m. with her mother. They go to a local supermarket where Natalie wants to buy a new calculator. But when she goes to pay, she realizes she's forgotten her money, so she goes back to the apartment on her own to grab it. When she calls the elevator, she senses a presence behind her. She enters, as does he. She presses number six, he presses number three. At floor three, he pushes her out of the elevator and drags her by the arm into the stairwell. Thankfully, according to Natalie, the man then hears footsteps in the stairwell. So he takes out a cloth, dries Natalie's tears and flees. That's at least three incidents involving young girls in less than a month, resulting in one murder, one attempted murder, and one assault. It's a matter of urgency that they find this man as quickly as possible. They know they must be dealing with a sick individual. And despite the witness sightings and the statements of the surviving victims, they have little else to go on. All they know is that he's in his early 20s around six foot tall and suffers from acne. He hunts his victims in a methodical way and plans his attacks in advance. Despite all the witnesses describing the attacker as well-dressed and professional looking, police decide to bring in all the local homeless people, the exact opposite of the profile provided. A year goes by with no more cases and the parents of Paris breathe a sigh of relief. At the same time, however, the inquiry grinds to a complete halt. The killer is still out there. Simon, 14, is enjoying his birthday in his Paris apartment. The doorbell rings, and when he goes to see who it is, there is a man standing there. He identifies himself as a policeman. He shows Simon his badge, and he is also armed. Simon, concerned that he was making too much noise, apologizes to the man, who just stares back at him. The man then pushes Simon back into his apartment and ties him up along with the other children at the party. Simon is then assaulted, traumatized and in a state of shock. Simon tells police the man was young and had marks all over his cheeks. The pockmarked man has struck again. 28 days later, a double murder shakes France to its core. 
Gilles and Sylvie Politi live in the fourth arrondissement of Paris with their daughter, who is three years old. Down the hall in a studio lives a 20 year old au pair called Imgard Muller, who would go to the apartment every day to look after the flat and the kit. Sylvie works during the day and Gilles has a night job, so daytime is his sleeping time. That morning, Ermgard drops the kid off at school as usual. What happened between Ermgard getting back from school and Sylvie getting back from work at 7 p.m., nobody knows. When Sylvie returns to the apartment that evening, she immediately senses that something is wrong. The flat is in pitch black and it is too quiet. Her husband should be here, her daughter too. She turns on the main living room light to see her husband tied up on the couch. He is lying on his front, his hands tied to his feet behind his back. There is another rope tied around his neck attached to his feet. Gilles is dead. By moving his legs, it tightened the rope around his neck and he died of asphyxiation. In horror, Sylvie sprints towards her child's room. She turns on the light and discovers the most horrific scene imaginable. The au pair, Ermgard, has been hung by her arms from the upright frame of a bunk bed, her throat slashed with a knife. Both victims suffered physical torture via cigarette burns prior to death. She screams out for her daughter, a neighbor, sprints to the local school, desperately hoping to find her. And there she is, patiently waiting for her mother to pick her up. Police arrive on the scene, knowing in the back of their minds, they're probably dealing again with the pockmarked man. They go through Ermgard's room looking for any clues and they find something. Ermgard had a secret diary in which she had written down all her male conquests since arriving in France six months ago. 30 in total. All are swiftly identified and questioned, apart from the last one, a certain Ellie Lorange. And here's where it gets interesting. According to the French name registry, Ellie Lorange does not exist. So he must have given Ermgard a fake name. That's not all. The address he gave to her was a former photo lab for the police force. She writes that he was difficult, annoying, and she couldn't wait to get rid of him. Witnesses report seeing an athletic man enter Imgard's apartment on the 27th of April. He was seen again communicating with her through the intercom the following day, shortly before the killing took place. The night prior to the murder, neighbors heard a man asking to be let into her studio. Was it the man known as Ellie? Is Ellie Lorange our assassin? The French interior minister now interjects himself into this case. The possibility that this man could be law enforcement is now real and potentially a hugely embarrassing situation. A month after the double murder, the assaults continue. The numerous victims would describe the same scenario. An acne with a man shows them a police ID followed by a vicious assault. The sheer number of cases is staggering. At 10.30 a.m., Ursula gets a knock on her door. He says he's a police officer and he is there following a noise complaint and he wishes to come in. He pushes her inside, ties her up and assaults her. He leaves with her bank card and the pin number and withdraws 275 euros. She manages to free herself and call the police. Sonia, 24, is in her apartment and a man shows up at the door. She had placed an advert in a local shop for a piece of furniture she was selling and he said he was there because he was interested in buying it. He enters, threatens her with a gun, ties her up and steals her cash. The description once again corresponds to the pockmarked man. If we look at the timing of these assaults, this man can't have a typical nine to five. Plus he never carries out his attacks in the evening. Maybe he is married and attempts to fit in his evil routine around his family and his work. It doesn't stop. Marina, 34, opens her door to a man who claims to be a police officer and demands to enter. He forces his way in and cuts the phone line, but then an unexpected complication for the killer. Marina is not alone in the flat. She is with another woman who has an 18 month old baby. He ties them up and explains he's gonna rob the place. 
according to Marina, on discovering the extra people in the apartment. He doesn't know what to do. He had planned his assault and wasn't expecting this. He pretends to search the flat a little bit. He goes into the kitchen, grabs a knife, then cuts some fabric and gags the two women. Before being gagged, Marina blurted out that the plumber was coming around at 10 o'clock. This sends the man into a panic and he leaves the scene immediately. The pattern here is profoundly horrific. It would seem no one is safe, male, female, young or old. The killer understands that the police card puts him in an incredibly powerful position. The question is, are we dealing with a real policeman or someone just pretending? And what would happen if someone questioned his authority, asked him what he was really doing there? Well, we don't have to wait long to find out. Alice, 19, returns home for some lunch. And when she enters the lobby, a man stops her and demands to see her ID. Alice challenges him, suspects immediately that something is up and he senses it straight away and flees the scene. Just 15 minutes later, he intercepts Camille, 13 years old, and manages to bundle her into his car, claiming he's gonna give her a drive home. When they arrive home, the janitor spots Camille and asks her if everything is okay. The man cuts in, claiming to be a police officer investigating girls who had run away. Just by chance that day when they enter the apartment, her mum is there. As soon as he sees her, he legs it. He's not even out of the building and he comes across another girl. Jane, 13, is in the lobby and he repeats the same spiel, but she manages to get away. He seems to be becoming more desperate, unable to control his urges, acting without planning in advance. It turns out many of the girls had received letters before the attacks. He had been tracking them for several days. He had perhaps spotted them in the street, followed them and then taken note of their address. Maybe he lives close by, or he has a job which allows him to travel all over Paris. It's staggering that he doesn't even try to hide his face, which is plastered all over Paris, but no one can find him. On top of that, he's showing his police badge. If he is a policeman, how have none of his colleagues made the link? Once again, the case fails to advance in any significant way, and months turn into years. Fast forward to 1994, and we are no longer in Paris. Ingrid, 11 years old, is playing with friends in the countryside in a place called Mitri Mori. She's cycling near abandoned train tracks, and at 2 p.m. she decides to go home. She says goodbye to her friends, and off she goes. After a few minutes, she sees a white Volvo car approaching her and stop next to her. Ingrid also stops. He asks her for her ID. Ingrid felt very guilty because her mum had told her not to go down to the abandoned tracks. He said he was a cop and he was gonna take her to the station. He gets out of the car, puts her hands behind her back and handcuffs her. She is unaware at the time that she is face to face with the pockmarked man and she is about to face a living hell. She asks if they could stop off at home before going to the station, but he just ignores her. After an hour's drive, they arrive in a place called Sakli. He takes an abandoned road to an old farmhouse, but when he gets there, the gate is locked. He tries to smash through with the car, but it doesn't work. So they walk there through a hole in the wall. Ingrid is assaulted there. She stumbles out of the farmhouse in complete shock runs into another passerby who takes her back home. So what was he doing in Mitri Mori? And how did he know there would be an abandoned farm in the middle of nowhere? He didn't just come by it by chance. Now, this is crucial. It turns out the farmhouse was known to local farmers, to local forest workers. And guess what? It was used as a training facility for the police and fire services. Our killer has to be a policeman. The evidence seems to be staring them in the face now. This has to be someone in law enforcement. But at no point do investigators even entertain the idea. No checks are made, no interviews are conducted. They are in complete denial. The unwillingness to consider that the pockmarked man could be one of their own brings this case again to a complete standstill. And it's not until December of 2014 when the case ends up on the desk of Nathalie Turquet, that this inquiry finally heads in the right direction. 
and she dares to suggest what no one else would admit. The pockmarked serial killer may very well be a police officer. Media outlets and the internet are abuzz with rumours that a woman has alerted police to the disappearance of her husband following a summons he had received demanding him to provide a DNA sample in relation to the infamous serial killer case, otherwise known as the pockmarked man. Families of the victims, along with the rest of France, hold their collective breath as they await more news. Nathalie Turkey did what no one else dared, either through shame or fear. She demanded a DNA sample from 750 officers who worked in the Ile de France area during the time of the assaults and murders. Each officer was required to go to the closest police station and give their DNA, which would be compared to the DNA found at the scenes of the crimes. It took 35 years for this to happen. Most of them comply with no questions asked, but on Friday 24th of September 2021, police call a certain François Verov, a 59-year-old former policeman. He is told to submit his DNA in relation to an old case without being told anything specific. Almost immediately, he disappears from the home that he shared with his wife and daughter in La Grande Motte, close to Montpellier. Before leaving, he told her he was gonna go and check in some new tenants in a rental property they own. He kisses her goodbye and leaves home on his bike. She then hears no news from Francois and on checking his computer, she discovers that there are no tenants moving into the flat. His wife then calls police and tells them he is missing. She gives them the address of the apartment, thinking maybe he will be there. Suspicious of this sudden disappearance, investigators check out the apartment the following day and they find Francois Verov lying dead on the couch. He had consumed a large number of pills with alcohol and died in his sleep. They also find two letters, one requesting he not be resuscitated if the attempt on his own life failed and a second addressed to his wife and friends. In it, Varov admits to being a great criminal who committed unforgivable acts until the end of the 90s. He claims to have acted under the influence of uncontrollable urges. He also claims to have suppressed these impulses when he started a family with his wife. His note also states that he had done nothing untoward since 1997, implying there are more victims out there that authorities are not yet aware of. His last known confirmed victim was Ingrid in 1994. The following day, Natalie Turkey is informed of the grim discovery and procedures are accelerated as quickly as possible to process his DNA. At 10 p.m. that night, the results are published in the press. The DNA is a match. Francois Verov, former policeman, husband, and father was the serial killer known as the pockmarked man. Despite the evidence suggesting Turkey was onto something, she received a lot of criticism when she ordered the DNA requests, but she knew that if one of them was the killer, he would try to make a run for it or slip up in some way, or in this case, take his own life. So who is Francois Verov and how did he slip through the net for so many years? He was born in Gravelines in the north of France in 1962. An only child, he was raised by his strict father, his stepmother, and two half-sisters. His birth mother died of influenza when he was only 10 years old. In 1983, he arrived in Paris and joined the motorcycle unit of the police force. He married in June 1985 and transferred to the National Police in 1988. Following the birth of each of his children, Verov stopped his attacks in 1988 and late 1991. The gaps in his criminal activity now make a bit more sense. Prior to his son's birth, there were two other cases in 1991, which could not be officially linked to Verov, but bear all the hallmarks of his mode of attack. On January the 30th, Malika 11 is trapped by a man in an elevator. She identifies the attacker as Verov, 
and on the 4th of December, Sophie Nam, 23 years old, goes to conduct an apartment viewing in the 19th arrondissement of Paris. She is an intern in a local estate agency. She gets there for her 11 a.m. meeting and then disappears. The next day, her mother can't get hold of her. She calls the agency, who don't know where she is, and also don't seem particularly concerned that she's missing. It's not until 10 p.m. that night that someone from the agency goes around and discovers Sophie's lifeless body in the apartment. When police arrive, the scene is horrific. Her hands and feet are tied behind her back and she has been strangled with a belt. DNA was taken from her body, but somehow lost. Several elements suggest this crime was also the work of Verhoeven. The cause of death is strangulation. Sophie suffered the same knife wound as Cécile Bloch and the depth of the wound suggests that the same weapon was used. Finally, the belt tied around her neck was placed in exactly the same position as that of Ermgrad Muller in 1987. Several photos of Verov as a policeman have surfaced since we discovered his identity. It makes you wonder how many serial killers are walking around in plain sight. It doesn't bear thinking about. At the time, he had a white Volvo, which one of his victims, Ingrid, identified. She also told police that he had a cop ID and she was taken to a farm where police often conducted training exercises. No search of the area was carried out for someone with this vehicle. Surviving witnesses recall Varov branding an official business card from the police. He used police equipment like handcuffs and walkie talkies, spoke recognizable police jargon, and possessed an extensive knowledge of investigative procedure, which he used to escape detection. His colleagues would later say he would sometimes sleep in his car and shower at the station. It's an absolute failure on the part of the police investigating these crimes of an epic proportion, either through shame or a complete lack of intelligence. They fail to make the link between any of these crimes and François Verov an increasingly desperate and bold serial killer who took huge risks to satisfy his sadistic urges. How his wife didn't recognize him either from the sketches which bared a striking resemblance to her husband, I will never know. The question we must now ask is, did he really stop at the age of 35? Coincidentally, the year DNA testing started to become commonplace in police investigations. Or with age, did he simply perfect his killing technique to stay under the radar? The job for investigators is huge. He moved all over France and was incredibly skilled at hiding what he was up to. He managed to live two lives, one of a family man, the other as a serial killer and abuser who thought he was untouchable. As of today, police believe he could be responsible for many other cold cases as many as 28, according to the Parisian newspaper. Even though he ended his life at the age of 59, he was able to enjoy a few years of his life, unlike his victims and their families. The father of Cécile Bloch plunged into a deep depression following her death. He isolated himself in a small house in the countryside and dedicated his whole life to finding his daughter's killer, hiring a private detective along the way. A friend visited him in 2008. According to Dennis, he was dead inside. Nothing interested him anymore. He didn't eat. He didn't sleep. Jean-Pierre Bloch died alone in this house in 2011. He would never find out who killed his daughter. That is a wrap for this week, folks. Please subscribe if you'd like to support our channel and hit the bell so you'll be notified when we release a new video. We reply to all the comments, so please let us know what you thought about this case, whether the justice system let down these countless victims. We are always on the lookout for interesting and fascinating cases, so if there's anything you would like us to cover, please also leave in a comment below. Until next time, take care of yourselves, Stay safe. Merci beaucoup et au revoir.